we are distributed around the planet and we've got different backgrounds but what connects us is love of our planet within us but also yeah i think we've got one thing common in this group we cannot tell lies we cannot give false hopes and all of us i think in this team have got similar experiences which made this team together today uh, we spoke always truth for the love of our planet only uh, not for aiming uh, career not for aiming money <laughs> as return but to, just to speak the ethical truth for our uh, responsibility for the planet that we live in sometimes it costed us a lot sometimes it costed us even relationships even careers at some points it costed a lot i think in this group, all of us have this common experience which connects us today. And we will continue this way because we know that even though it's small, there is a community who can understand us and who appreciate to hear the truth from us. That's why we still continue, even though in times it's difficult for us as well. Where shall we start, everyone? We've got climate emergency going on. We've got war in Europe going on. We've got um, food security issues going on. We've got Arctic suddenly melting faster than expected some reason. I don't know. I don't find it faster than expected. I expected it even faster, but yeah, that's the common term. Where shall we start with? One of the reasons why I wanted to bring up the Arctic uh, at the get-go was I watched a presentation um, where Nick Breeze interviewed Jason Box, who's a, a, a famous glaciologist, and Nick has, has interviewed Guy before over the years. But there was a quote from Jason Box, quote, the whole Arctic is losing 10,000 cubic tons of ice per second. There are definitely changes taking place within the Arctic Ocean, and this impacts the entire planet. Dear Guy McPherson, would you like to tell about the impact of losing fresh water and uh, all the tipping points that we discussed on the land and uh, our food security, water security issues? Well, I think the most important existential threat we face is loss of Arctic ice. And that can be coming very soon, contrary to what you read in the peer-reviewed literature. The people who actually produce the peer-reviewed literature are not publishing this information, but they're letting it out in interviews. For example, James Anderson, the atmospheric scientist at Harvard, who famously linked chlorofluorocarbons in the hole in the Antarctic, he said in an interview with Forbes magazine in January of 2018 that we will have an ice-free Arctic Ocean next year with full effect being realized the following year. Jennifer McKinnon, when she was interviewed by CBS News in April 2021, indicated that probably we'll have an ice-free Arctic Ocean this year. Perhaps it'll be next year. But if we look at the best case scenario of those two well-informed individuals, then that indicates that we can expect an ice-free Arctic next year with full effects, meaning loss of albedo and release of even more methane and so on in 2024, which is not long from now. There, you know, as you know, as everybody here knows, there are dozens of so-called tipping points, so for enforcing feedback loops that we can talk about involving freshwater, land systems, overheating in general. It, what relatively few people know is that the advisory group on greenhouse gases, which was the predecessor to the IPCC, indicated that one degree C was the absolute upper limit, that that was the point at which things would start falling apart. And they started falling apart before then, in fact, David Spratt, science writer and speaker about climate change, says we triggered those self reinforcing feedback loops at a half a degree C above the 1750 baseline. So we're already 
dealing with, quote, runaway climate change with respect to those self-reinforcing feedback loops and the inability to turn back the clock. Finally, the IPCC acknowledged that we were in the midst of abrupt and irreversible climate change with two separate reports mm, three, three and four years ago. And yet nobody seems to be paying much attention to that information. When the IPCC, perhaps the most conservative scientific body in the history of the planet, when they conclude that we're in the midst of abrupt climate change and irreversible climate change, that should be on the news every day. Really. And instead, we just see celebrity blah, blah, blah on the news every day. Uh, we are full speed going to Blue Ocean event, losing the Arctic. Does anyone in the group seem, uh, thinks that uh, we can just uh, push the brake of this car, full speed car, and uh, stop it? Or do you see that we already lost the Arctic, but the rest is just a matter of time? Guy McPherson, would you like to start? I would hate to start. So yes, I'll go first. <laughs> I think it's too late. And if it's not too late from a physical perspective, I think it's too late from a social perspective. I'm reminded of a line from John Kenneth Galbraith, the Canadian, econ Canadian American economist, diplomat, public official, public intellectual. He said, people of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. That's people of privilege. That's what they would do. And if that's what we need to kickstart and then fully implement the mere reflection framework, for example, then it's never going to happen because those people are not interested in giving up any material part of their advantage. They just are not going to do it. So it doesn't really matter what the five of us think, does it? What really matters is the people who have the means to implement those kind of large scale projects, like for example, World War III, and they seem to be pointed in, in the opposite direction of what the majority of the populace would like them to point. I think that's terrible. Thank you so much. Kevin Hester, what do you think? Did we already lose the Arctic and the rest is just a matter of time or there's a break uh, point option to stop the car approaching to this end? I don't think we have any agency whatsoever in influencing how this situation will evolve. We're so far off the cliff. We're, we're, we're multiple decades beyond being able to do that. But we do have agency on how we behave between now and collapse. Are we going to tell the truth to the youth? Or are we going to bullshit them at the edge of extinction? I won't have a bar of that, and I won't have a bar of anyone who's going down that road. And just one last thing about the, um, the Arctic Ops, sea ice, is that there's a, a wonderful um, paper published by Scripps Institute of Oceania, and they said that a blue ocean event is equivalent, you know, the loss of albedo from a blue ocean event will be the equivalent of 25 years of current emissions. The last 25 years is more than all the previous anthropogenic uh, influences. This is how far off the cliff we have gone. Over to you, John. Jim Massa, what do you think? What's your opinion? The same question. Do you think oh, I, we I, lost it already or is there an option to break? Well, I agree with uh, uh, Guy and Kevin. It's, it is too late. Um, you know, e even uh, whether when exactly the BOE happens, it's still what's leading up to it. We are having uh, an earlier melting of whatever sea ice is there because of the continual heat input from not just the Atlantic side, but also the Pacific side, is that this heat is diffusing, keeping the, uh, the waters open longer. So we now have... The, the seasonality of when there's uh, minimal ice is extending. It's now up to seven months of the year. And so this continual heat diffusion from below 
not only melts the ice early in the year, but prevents it from freezing later in the year. So now you have this you know, extended open water uh, time period that's uh, more albedo, that's loss or not. So you have more absorption of heat energy. We, we are also losing the multi-year ice, the thick ice, the ice volume is drastically dropping. That is another key uh, consideration uh, that needs to be mentioned. So you take all these things together and it, it's the Arctic will not will soon become a region that we can no longer recognize as being Arctic in nature. We'll have to maybe call it something else. But you know, the typical characteristics that define the Arctic is basically being tossed aside. It, it's just drastically changing. One thing I want to mention about you know, tipping points and so forth, a paper uh, published by PIK came out uh, last year and this paper was a very thorough um, examination of interactions among various tipping elements. So it wasn't so much of, oh, what happens if AMOC shuts down? What happens you know, with the Amazon? What happened? But they tried to synthesize all the possible interactions. You know, uh, do the interactions augment or mitigate what, what is happening? Very extensive papers, the first of its kind to attempt this study and put it together. And the overall finding to me was extremely telling. Basically, what they came down, uh, their conclusions, as you will, was that an increase of 1.3 C is enough to cause a catastrophic, you know, all shits hit the fan, basically, at which point there is no reversibility. Well, if you go by the IPCC saying that we're at 1.2, and that, of course, they keep changing the, the, you know, the baseline. They keep moving the goalposts around so that, to me, it's, it's invalid. If you go back to 1750 baseline, which should be, well, we've kind of already gone past the 1.3. And so this, again, goes to the point that Guy had made earlier, which is that it's too late and think we're already in a climate collapse. And this, this study was, you know, I found it to be very telling. And it's the first of its kind, but people need to look at this paper and, and carefully take away the information that they're conveying because um, it's very stark. If I can get the paper name, I will put it into description. Dear Guy McPherson, would you like to say anything about uh, the shift of the baseline in this point? Oh, that's the favorite trick, right? <laughs> favorite trick of the IPCC and a lot of other people as well. We just keep moving around. But Professor Andrew Glickson in Australia indicated in his October 2020 book, The Event Horizon, that we already are beyond two watts per square meter, which means we're already beyond two degrees C above the 1750 baseline. So for people who don't play that game, who don't lie by shifting the baseline, we're already done and it didn't take 2C. 2C never mattered as we've known since October of 1985, when the advisory group on greenhouse gases indicated that one degree C is really the upper limit. And then beyond that, we've discovered that we've triggered a whole bunch of self-reinforcing feedback loops, a bunch of tipping points, even before that one degree C came along. And yet people are still trying to hide it. Is there anything which surprises you too, dear Guy McPherson, if I start, make a turn. <laughs> I'll come back, John, I'll make the turn again. When asked, how they could see the future. Science fiction writers George Orwell, Ray Bradbury, and Aldous Huxley each gave the same answer. They all said that they aren't predicting the future. They were reporting on events that were currently underway. I can relate. That's exactly how I felt for the last decade or so. The, of, of course, there are exceptions. Some things are fast, happening faster than expected. For example, my complete removal, my complete deplatforming from a social and public life happened so fast, I couldn't even believe it myself. I was warned, and then eight months later, I was completely deplatformed, 
and I couldn't believe it. I, some days I still can't believe it. Some days I still think I'm going to go on tour again. I'm going to look people in the eye. I'm going to give them the facts. That's the only way to convince most people. And But it's not ever going to happen. So some things are happening even faster than I expected. And things have been going really fast. You know, most people have difficulty understanding the exponential function. I've understood the exponential function as an ecologist for a very long time. And yet still, sometimes I'm caught off guard. And I suppose that's all of us, right? That every once in a while, there's something that comes up and we say, wow, I thought that would be at least the day after tomorrow. It's already here. Wow. Amazing. Kio Nestar, is there anything that you see it's faster than you expected? I was in Berlin one week before the Berlin Wall fell down. My darling ex-wife took a picture of me pissing on the wall, and then a week later it fell down. And I, I, my claim to fame was I undermined the foundations of the Berlin Wall. But the point of, the, of that, this part of the story is that there was no hint in Berlin that the East, that East Germany was about to collapse, and by, by dint of that, that the war would cease to have any meaning. Within a few months of that, the Soviet Union collapsed. People don't understand how tenuous this is. This is a, a Jenga stack that we're discussing. All my life, it's getting more and more and more unstable. And boom, it fell down. I think people have to realize that this collapse is underway now. And it, we could wake up tomorrow morning to a completely new paradigm. I honestly believe that. 